October 15th, millions of young people all over the world took to the streets and they were joined by their parents' generation and their grandparents' generation and they spoke with a single voice. And what they said was clear and compelling. They are protesting unresponsive governments who bail out billions of dollars in subsidies to underwrite global banks and financial institutions and companies while cutting basic public services to the rest of the people. They're angry because there are no jobs. The economy has collapsed. They have very little hope for their future. And what these young people are doing is saying enough is enough. It's our turn. We're a new generation. We want a new vision for the future. This has happened before. This happened in 1848 when another generation of young people took to the streets across European capitals and they protested the abuse of autocratic governments and rapacious business interests and they toppled the monarchies. This happened again in 1968 when a generation of young people took to the streets around the world and they protested again the abuses of unresponsive government and they created the peace movement and the women's movement and the ecology movement and the animal rights movement to save the world. Today, these young people here in 2011, they have a message and their message is there's something unfair in the way this world is organized. There's something wrong when 1% of the population has most of the wealth and 99% of the people are increasingly marginalized and disenfranchised. We need to have a clear understanding as to why the jobs have disappeared, why the economic opportunities have dried up, why our environment's deteriorating, why our global economy has collapsed. We are ending a great industrial era based on fossil fuels. When oil went up to $147 a barrel a few years ago on world markets, all the other prices in the world went up because everything's made out of fossil fuels. Pesticides, fertilizers, construction materials, power, transport, heat, light, all of it. So the question is, why is this happening? Why is there no jobs for young people? Why is it that uh, the economy is collapsing? Why is it that this beautiful planet we live in is deteriorating and we are now threatened as never before? First, we need to understand that the second industrial revolution based on fossil fuels is now sunsetting. The energies are getting too expensive, coal, oil, gas, uranium. And now the technologies based on those energies, they're very old. They, they have no multiplier effect. And the entire infrastructure of this civilization based on these carbon fuels is now on life support. How do we regrow a global economy in the last stages of an energy era? Fossil fuels are the most elite energies in the world. They're not found everywhere. They're only found in a few places. So they require huge military investments to secure them. And they require massive finance capital from banks to organize them from the wellhead to the final user. The result is the second industrial revolution has created a top-down, centralized energy regime and economic structure unparalleled in history. And today, at the end of the second industrial revolution, three of the five largest companies in the world are global energy companies. And underneath these companies are the large banks that finance this second industrial revolution energy infrastructure. And under the banks are 500 or so global companies who feed off the oil spigot from telecommunications to transport. And when we put this all together, it's shocking to realize that these 500 companies make up a third of the GDP of the entire world. That's 500 companies. So we've created this very, very centralized elite second industrial revolution energy, technology, and infrastructure. And now, as we end this age in history, 1% of the population that's controlled this pyramid has benefited immensely and 99% of the population that's at the bottom of this pyramid has been disenfranchised and is getting poorer and poorer. What do we do? We need a new economic vision for the world that's compelling. We need a new economic game plan for the world that's deliverable. We need a new way to organize society based on justice, inequity, and sustainability. So we need to ask the question, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? Because that'll give us a roadmap to where we need to go. The great economic revolutions occur when new energy regimes emerge and when they then converge with new communication revolutions. 
When communication and energy revolutions come together, they change economic history. They change the way power is distributed. Today, we're on the cusp of a great new communication energy convergence, a third industrial revolution, a revolution for the young people in the October 15th movement around the world. We've had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 15 years, the personal computer and the internet. And what is so interesting about the internet is that this electricity communication is very different than the one I grew up on the 20th century. I grew up on telephones, radio, television, centralized, organized, top down. By contrast, the internet revolution is organized very differently. It's distributed. It's collaborative. Millions of young people come together in vast networks and they exercise lateral power, side by side power. This internet communication revolution is just now beginning to merge with a new energy regime, distributed energies. And when distributed collaborative communications manages distributed collaborative energies, we have a powerful shift in the economic paradigm of the world. What are distributed energies? Well, they're really very different than the elite energies that we've used in the 19th and 20th century. Distributed energies are found everywhere. They're found in everybody's backyard. The sun shines all over the world every day. The wind blows across this beautiful little planet every single day. Underneath the ground, there's a hot geothermal core of energy that can be used every day. If you live in the rural areas, there's agricultural and forestry waste. It can be converted back to energy. On the coastal areas, the ocean tides, the ocean waves, they're coming in every day. They're a source of energy. And wherever we have garbage, it can be decomposed back to energy. We have enough of these distributed renewable energies to provide for our species until kingdom comes. The third industrial revolution is made up of five pillars. Together, these five pillars create an infrastructure, a nervous system for a new social organism that will provide lateral power, that will create a just society. Pillar one, we have to go to green renewable energies, the energies that are found in our backyard. Pillar two, how do we collect these energies in our backyard with our buildings? You know, there are millions of buildings all over the world. And these buildings are going to be transformed in the next 40 years to personal power plants. Every home, every office, every factory is going to be reconfigured into your own personal green power plant. So you and I can collect solar activity on the roof, wind on the walls, heat underneath the ground of our buildings. Our buildings become our own personal power plants. And here's the analogy. You know, back in 1970, we had these big centralized mainframe computers. Today, thanks to Steve Jobs and the internet revolution, we now all have our own desktop computers and our own cell phones and we can create our own information. Now our buildings are going to be doing the same thing for us. They're going to collect all that ample green energy surrounding the buildings. This is going to jumpstart construction. Converting all the buildings of the world is going to require millions and millions of jobs and thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises over 40 years to completely shift our real estate into our own personal power plants. Pillar three, we have to store this energy because the sun isn't always shining when we need it for electricity. Sometimes the wind's blowing at night, you need the electricity during the day. These are intermittent energies. So we're going to use hydrogen to store these energies. Hydrogen is the basic element of the universe. So when the sun is hitting your roof and you have a photovoltaic power plant up there, you generate electricity. If you don't need some of that electricity, some surplus, you can put that into water. The hydrogen comes out of the water into a tank. And then when the sun isn't shining, you simply convert that hydrogen back to green electricity, a small thermodynamic loss. Pillar four is where the internet revolution converges with the renewable energy revolution to create a nervous system for a new infrastructure, for a new economy. We take internet technology and we transform the entire electricity grid of the world to an energy internet. So that when millions and millions of buildings are collecting green energy on site, storing that energy in hydrogen, like we store media in digital. And then if you don't need some of that energy, and some of your neighbors do, your software can direct your energy across an energy internet, and you can share it across continents, just like we create our own information and we share it online. Pillar five is transport. Electric vehicles are out this year. Fuel cell vehicles will be out in 2014. We'll be able to plug in all of our cars, buses, and trucks into our infrastructure, our buildings, and get green electricity. 
then wherever we travel, there will be power charges. And we can plug back in and get green electricity from our buildings. Or if the price is right, we can take the electricity in our cars and send it back to the grid and make money. These five pillars together are the nervous system. They are actually the mega technology platform for a new economic era in history. This is power to the people. This is the democratization of energy. This is lateral power. And for the generation that grew up on the internet and has been empowered to create their own information and share it in vast social spaces, this is stage two. Joining that internet technology to energy and now a whole generation creating their own green energy, their green electricity, and sharing in vast commons that stretch across entire continents. The music companies, they didn't understand file sharing and music. When millions and millions of young people began to create software to distribute and collaborate and share their music in vast networks, the music companies thought it was a joke. Then the music companies went out of business because they could not compete with lateral power. Millions of young people joining together to share their music in commons. And you know, the newspapers didn't understand the blogosphere. And now the newspapers are creating blogs that are going out of business. As powerful as these changes are in the social spaces of the internet, when the internet joins with renewable energy, it's 100 times more powerful because it changes the political landscape fundamentally. The young people in the October 15th movement, they don't think right-left. They don't think capitalism, socialism. They don't think ideology. That's 20th century. When the young people judge institutional behavior, the October 15th movement, their political spectrum is quite different. They ask this question. Does this institutional behavior, whether it's government, business, education, is this institutional behavior centralized, patriarchal, top-down? Is it closed? Is it proprietary? Or is this institutional behavior distributed? Is it collaborative? Is it open and transparent? Is it lateral power? This is the new politics of a new generation, the generation that's taken to the streets around the world in the October 15th movement. Lateral power brings with it a much more equitable distribution of the fruits of society. Because when millions and millions of people are sharing their energy, their resources, their economic wealth, we create a good quality of life. Nobody's left behind. We all become entrepreneurs, but we all collaborate in social networks. This is the way a decent, humane economy should operate on this planet. Then we won't have the 99% versus the one. We'll have the 100% living together in a just and sustainable world. This is a big challenge for the October 15th movement. Let me be very blunt, if I may. The young people in this October 15th movement have shown very clearly that they know how to use the logistics of the Internet and Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and Google to bring millions of people together on the streets. It was a logistical success. Now the question that looms is, can this October 15th movement take the tremendous communication technology within their grasp and use this to transform the economy, to create lateral power, to change the political dynamic of the planet, to heal this earth, and to create a sustainable future for generations not yet here. This is a daunting task. It is a great challenge. And this is a seminal turning point in history. All of us in the older generation we took great heart when we saw millions of young people take to the streets on October 15th. And we saw them speak as one. And they were articulating what we were feeling. But the young generation had the passion, the commitment, the drive, the organizing abilities to say what we weren't able to say. And that is, there's something wrong with this system, but we can make it right. We have opportunities out there, and we now have to take advantage of them. So my hope for this young generation point the way, direct us into a new future, one that we can be proud of because we've shared the great fruits of this planet. We've protected the interests of our fellow creatures. We've preserved this earth for future generations. We've made a better world. We're counting on you.